Beyond Fear, Destiny Awaits, in the game Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy by Gale Force 9 and Legendary. In the game Dune, or of course, working on the planet Arrakis, you'll be playing as one of the four different rivaling factions, whether it be House Atreides, Harkonnen, or even one of the Freemen. And your objective is to control areas on the board. And if you can't do that, and nobody can do that, by the end of the game, you'll add up your points in whoever has the most, being the spice. The spice, of course, is life. Utilize your characters well during battle, and of course, your forces during the round to avoid sandstorms, worms, and of course, gathering spice on the planet Arrakis. Will you be able to succeed in this modular epic board game? Find out as I talk to you about setting up, how to play, and of course my review for the game, Dune! The setup for the game of Dune is very simple. Go ahead and take the board and place it in front of all players. Then take all the spice and put it in the spice bank. Set aside the round token and the phase token. Place the round token on one and the phase token will be on the storm. Then give every single player a player card or a player board, as well as their leaders and their resort reserve stock, and place those tokens in that area. It will tell you how many forces and how many leaders you get on your player card. Additionally, give every single player spice, and that spice is also going to be designated based on your player card as well. Each player will receive four trader cards, and select one of them. However, there are certain classes that have different rules, such as the Harkonnen, who can choose more than one when using them throughout the game. Each of the characters have their own unique advantages and disadvantages, and changes to the rules of the game, so if you want explicit, exact definitions of how to play each character, check the rulebook. But for instance, the Imperium is based on gathering money, Harkonnen is based on traders, the Atreides is kind of a mix-all, and the Fremen are able to basically work in the Polar Sink and can ride sandworms. A pretty useful and interesting different combination of characters and classes in the game. After you've done so, you're going to start playing the rounds of the game, and the game will begin by selecting one player to receive the first player marker. The first phase of the game is the storm phase, in which a player, the first player, will roll this die here. This is the storm die. And of course, the storm marker will be placed on the board in the storm area. Once they've rolled the die, they'll move the storm a number of spaces based on the roll. When a storm moves across or onto a specific space or area that has kind of a pie conal shape uh, of your characters or characters present in those areas, in certain areas, you will suffer losses. There's penalties to that. And for more exact definitions, you can check the rule book. But basically the idea is storms are bad, avoid them unless you're the Fremen because then you can do what you want. Then you move on to the next phase of the game, which is the Spice Blow. During the Spice Blow phase, you're going to draw a Spice card, and the Spice card will tell you two different areas to place a certain number of Spice. This is basically your currency in the game. You'll be utilizing it mainly for cards and to give to certain characters, and of course to utilize for placing more characters in specific locations on the board. After you've done that, place it on the bottom of the deck and move on to the next phase. The next phase of the game is the Gain Cards phase. Each player will receive a certain number of battle cards. These will help you throughout the battle in kind of like rock, paper, scissors conundrum, as well as, of course, cards from the market deck, which you can pay for. And if there's a certain character in the game, which I believe is the Imperium, you'll have to give them a certain amount of money in the game in order to gather cards. But whenever they buy cards, they have to buy it from the market or from the deck. After you've gathered your battle and market cards, you'll move on to the revival step. The revival step is fairly simple as well. You'll get two units to take from your tanks area, basically your dead units and put them back into your supply. Then you can spend two resources or two spice to gather additional units and place them into your supply. If you lose leaders, you're going to have these little circular characters that you'll use during battle, you can spend their cost to put them back from your tanks into your reserve. These guys are going to benefit you in battle and give you a higher value at the end of battle in order for you to win combat. Once each player has had a chance to basically gather their units back, you'll move on to the next phase, which is the shipping and moving phase. Shipping and moving is very simple. Basically, you'll spend as much spice as you'd like, and when you do so, you'll gain that many characters, or that many of your, I should say, reserves, your forces, and you'll place them in any area on the map. Then, after that, you can choose any one of your pool of characters in a specific given location to move up to three spaces. Once you have done that, placed and then moved any, you can even place and move the same one, you'll pass turn and each player will do that as well. Basically, paying for units, and then, of course, placing them down and moving them. The next step is the battle step, and how battle works is fairly simple. Basically, if ever two factions are in a given area, and only two can ever be in one given area, there's going to be a battle. And battle will play take place from turn to turn, starting with the first player and any of their battles following along to the next player. Battles will use these boards here. These are the battle wheels here. 
battle wheels will indicate the amount of forces that you're going to be having um, basically on that space, as well as if you'd like to use one of your leaders to place down here, and of course, battle cards. You're going to be able to use a weapon um, as well as a defensive item. So for instance, I can use a pistol and a defensive uh, poison, and the other player will do the same. And that has potential benefits, basically allowing you to destroy your opponent's leader or basically protecting your leader from an opponent's attack. They're basically rock, paper, scissor cards. Additionally, after the battle uh, positions have been chosen, how many forces and your leader, you'll reveal them and you'll reveal the weapons. And if your opponents revealed any of the traitors that you have in your hand, like for, for instance, if I was playing as a Harkonnen and maybe perhaps Atreides was utilizing this general here, uh, Thurif Hawat, and this is a four general, then I can declare that this general was actually on my side as a Harkonnen traitor, in which case I would win the battle. So these are instant victory cards, but you only have so many of them if you're not playing as the Harkonnen, whereas if you're the Harkonnen, you're going to have more uh, traitors. And additionally, during each round at a certain time in the game, you can actually trade out traders to kind of uh, benefit you throughout the game. If, however, neither player or none of the players in any of the combats have any traders, you're just going to pay place the values out based on whatever it is, your weapons and your defenses, your leader, and of course the amount of forces you have. Tally up those values, and whoever has the most is the winner, defeating the other player. And of course, you'll also lose units as a good guy, and whatever you have left will be what you can use for the spice phase. The spice phase is very simple. How it works is you will check the spice locations on the board, and each location that has characters or forces on them will be able to turn over spice to those players. So for instance, if I was the Atreides house and I had two units on a space that had four spice, each of my units can take two spice from that location, then giving me four spice total. And if I have more units than spice, I take all the spice. If I have less units than spice, I'll leave the remainder. And spice is useful because that's when you can use it to buy stuff like market cards. You can use it to place out forces during the certain phases of the game. It's your general currency for the game. It's what keeps you going. Afterwards, you're going to check for a win. If you have the win, the game is over, it's done, good job. Otherwise, you're then going to go ahead and move back to the storm phase. You're then going to turn the round to round two and proceed to the next round of play, playing out all five rounds until either victory has been concluded or the end of the game triggers and you check for points. Let's talk about the two different ways to win. Well, the first way, of course, is strongholds. And you can't win on the first two rounds of play. And it's in fact, it's noted on the board here that the one and the two in the rounds are negated. They're kind of grayed out. But once three, four, and five come along, after that spice phase, if you have at least one unit in three different strongholds on the board, and if you can see the board, there's certain areas on the board that illustrate strongholds, if you have one of the, one unit of, uh, on each of those three areas, or three areas in total, you win the game but it could only be on rounds three, four, or five. Otherwise, you'll proceed to the next round. The other way to win is pretty simple. At the end of the fifth round, you're gonna tally up all your value, all your points, and there's generally a, a, a way in which it's gonna happen in the book, which you can go ahead and look up yourself, but whoever has the most points, based on how well you did throughout the game, whether it be in currency or in battle, you will get basically add up those points, and whoever has the most is the winner of the game, Dune. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, kind of a streamlined game of like Rex or uh, of like the original Dune, but kind of put in place a little, little easier, a little more straightforward, I suppose. But anyway, that's basically how they play the game Dune. All right, let's talk about my review now. Oddly enough, I own the original Dune. However, I haven't played it, but I have played Rex. And Rex is probably a more complex version of this game. This one's kind of a lighter, more streamlined version with more simplistic rules, which works really well for more gateway gamers who wanna play something that involves some tips and tricks that utilizes this battle wheel here as well as your leaders, and of course, involves area control. It's kind of a nice stepping up from like something like Risk or another type of area control like Cthulhu Wars, if you wanna have something a little more deeper in terms of different types of stylization and character classes. Now, of course, Cthulhu Wars can get, get it's really deep uh, after, after the base game, of course, but I just mean like it, it's, it's an area control game with unique character classes and, of course, perspectives in how you want to win the game. There's multiple different ways to win the game here. Well, one of the easiest ways to win the game is by gathering strongholds. It doesn't matter about how much you win in battle, doesn't matter if you have a lot of spice, all that's relevant is getting to those locations at the end of the third, fourth, or fifth round, being the only person there in three of the locations and winning. 
Other classes are probably better at pushing the game forward. Classes that are able to get a lot of money can generate a much better way of uh, succeeding in that way. Whereas maybe like something like the Fremen or the Harkonnen are better at just con containing and controlling victory in locations. And you should probably play to the strengths of those classes. My favorite of all of these classes is the Harkonnen. I know they're the bad guys, but I really enjoy playing with the traitor cards and being able to switch them out and guessing what my players are going to be utilizing against me in order to win battles without actually having to spend anything. It's a nice little tactic in order to save your units because everyone's basically spending except for the house that doesn't actually have to spend. And uh, it's always nice to not have to spend, <laughs> specifically when you only have so many limited resources available to you. I also really enjoy the market deck and the spice deck. There's worm cards that are going to pop out. Uh, the market deck has a lot of value in it, but has a high risk and cost to it. Most of the cards are very, very beneficial. And you'll have to weigh the choices as to whether or not you want to actually utilize these cards or not. And one of them might be something like at the end of the shipping and movement phase, after all players have moved, make an extra on-planet force movement into a territory you can reach except for an unoccupied stronghold. That's a very beneficial thing, having an extra movement. But is it worth the cost, especially when you need that cost for units and other things in the game. Or perhaps if I need to retreat. If your forces are in battle and they retreat anytime before battle plans are revealed, retreat using your normal movement rule to any one territory you occupy alone or an unoccupied rock or sand territory, which is beneficial in retreating. That all has to do with battle. There's more complexity to a lot of what I explained. I gave you the basic rundown of how the game is played to kind of move on because if you really want to get into it, the game is easy to find the rulebook and understand and read through yourself. And it's just a little unique, unique Intrinsic intrinsities, intrinsicies, I don't know, for each of the different character classes and what they do. And they all function differently and play very differently, which is a big plus for me. The battle board is very nice. All the components are high quality. Uh, my one main issue with the game thus far is that the board gets bowed. <laughs> I've only had this game for maybe about a month and a half, and I don't know what it was, the humidity or what, maybe it's the area I live in, but the board is bowed as all hell. And <laughs> it, it's still playable. Uh, it's just like, bent a little bit and I don't know what causes it maybe it's my fault but I noticed that as an issue cards are high quality artwork is very nice the planet is very recognizable you can see where certain spaces are from other spaces I had a big problem with a game like this called the evil dead one of the games I really enjoy because it's from one of my favorite IPs just like this one is but it's hard to tell the difference between one space and another and this one it's a lot easier to see the difference which is very nice and of course there's additional tokens and components in the game based on the number of players and to utilize different mechanics and things which is also a nice touch as well. Uh, trader mechanic is amazing. The fact that all the characters function differently. The quality of the game is excellent, except for maybe the player board, or, the, or the, I should say the board of the game. And the fact that it's very quick and very straightforward and streamlined is nice as well. I can teach this game in about 10 minutes. We can get into it and the game is over in an hour if people have listened to the rules correctly and understand the basics. Yes, there's a little bit of technicalities as to what the storms can do, how the market cards function and wins best to use your players. And of course you get better as you play the game and you learn about the specific character classes you use. If you go from Harkonnen to Fremen, you might have a different battle strategy and it might kind of change the complexity of the game and how you're going to utilize that class and it may, may, may make it harder or more difficult for you to understand the game, which is fine though, because that presents a unique new difficulty and a more reason to want to play the game more and more. If you're interested in a game that's about diplomacy, conquests, controlling different areas, utilizing traders and these unique battle boards, which I've now seen in about three or four games, but they're all based on the same exact, uh, I don't know if it's the same makers or what, but these, these boards are now pretty frequent in those four games. It's the Rex, it's the other Dune, it's this one here, and I think there's one other one that functions kind of like it. I still really enjoy it. I like the flipping flipping them up kind of thing. It reminds me of Cosmic Encounter with a few more steps, which is also kind of fun. And uh, it's kind of a, a solid style of mechanic for area control games. There's not as much luck involved in the game. There is risk involved and there's a ton of choices that you can make. But overall, I really had a ton of fun playing this game. And I'd definitely be interested in playing it again. It'll depend on the player group, of course. And if they're interested in playing a game, that's a little bit more on the medium to somewhat heavier side as far as strategy, but overall solid fun game. I probably won't play as the Fremen though, because they always start in the polar sink and have to move outwards. I like the Harkonnen. They're just plain evil. Thank you for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy by uh, Legendary and by Gale Force 9. If you want to pick up the game, there's a link down below in the description. If you'd like to watch more videos like this one, you can go ahead and subscribe down here. And <laughs> go ahead and click the notification button too to see more videos just like this one. We have another Dune game that came from Gale Force 9, which we'll be reviewing, which is more of a trader based game, kind of like Resist and those type of games, werewolf, mafia, etc. And I will show you that very, very soon. And uh, you can
can decide for yourself which one you might like more. If you like the theme from the Dune universe, though, it's super fun. The moon shell is in now. We have it in the garage. We're just waiting on the last bits. We need the pins to come in. We need the last trays to come in. And then we're gonna get them on the, um, in, in the shipping and going out. I think that the shipping place may have them. I have to go ahead and check, but overall we're really, really close. No games have been sold. We're waiting for the Kickstarter backers to get theirs first, but I just want to let you guys know that we are still on track for hopefully by the end of the year. That's the goal. Well, maybe before Christmas if we're really lucky, but I don't know. We'll see. That's all I got for you guys this time. And as always, I look forward to gathering the spice without you next time. <laughs>